Some people call Colombia the mad country. Alongside the ravages of the cocaine trade, Colombia is being slowly pulled apart by South America's longest running civil war. High above the leftist guerrilla stronghold of the Choco jungle, a Colombian guider band plays as loud as possible to ward off their fear of flying. We were given space too in this old Russian chopper and we were just as happy to be diverted from thoughts of the machine's maintenance record. Not to mention the possibility that someone down there might have anti-aircraft weapons. The army had brought us and its travelling circus to the remote jungle town of Rio Sucio. Until recently, the town was the northern headquarters of the FARC guerrilla movement. Now the army has won it back. A rare victory for the government side that seems to be slowly losing to the Marxist insurgency. So rare that the head of the Colombian army is being flown in to officially reclaim the town. But despite the bravado, there are still guerrillas in the surrounding jungle. A surprise attack would end the general's PR campaign in its tracks. There are echoes here of the US Army's Hearts and Minds campaign in rural Vietnam. But it all has a distinctly Colombian twist. We are celebrating today because of the visit of the general. Someone's giving us the strength to live again. Less than a week after his troops suffered their worst ever defeat against the guerrillas in the south of the country, General Bonnet needs a public victory just to keep his job. But lift the flap of the circus tent and the picture changes dramatically. To defeat the guerrillas, the general's men threw away the rule book so that right-wing death squads could operate freely. Many of the people in Rio Sucha were happy to see the end of the Marxist petty tyrants who ruled their lives for so long. But they're scared to talk about the new power brokers. For here, the army has allowed illegal paramilitary forces to conduct a dirty war. The paramilitary groups under the control of a warlord called Carlos Castaño were used to cleanse the countryside, overrunning hamlets, executing suspected leftists and forcing their neighbours to run. The prime cause of internal displacement, internal displacement in Colombia are the paramilitary groups. They operate as, as private armies of, uh, uh, linked to very specific economic interests.
Many of the refugees fled from the jungle to the Gulf of Uraba, more than a day's journey away. They came in their thousands to squalid camps like this one in the sports arena of the town of Turbo. All of them with stories of the coming of the paramilitary. Over and over, there was violence. They told us to leave and we left. They came across the land accompanied by the army. They told us they were the paramilitary and that we had to leave. Only those people safely out of the jungle dare talk about what happened. Most of them lost family members. The paramilitary tortured people. They cut people's throats. I don't know what risk I take by saying this, but I have to say it because it's the truth. The way they operate, the, the paramilitary groups come into a town unarmed, very secretly begin to look around, see who in the town sells food to the guerrillas, who are the doctors that give them medicine, who are the, the uh, uh, bus drivers or the, or the the ones that give them transportation. Uh, and once they've identified what they consider to be guerrilla sympathizers, they simply one night come in with a list of all these people and uh, bring them together and massacre them. <laughs> Lord of the powerful, in whose hands is life and death, listen to these words of war. The army is adept at promoting the myth that it can win its own battles and that it can hold its ground when it does. A lot of people in Bogota say this town is an emporium for the guerrillas. They say this place is full of drug dealers. This is not true. This is a small town which has suffered violence. This is a town which has been abandoned. This is a town full of necessity. This is a town we are going to help. After years of conflict, the people of Rio Sucha will cheer for whoever appears the strongest. And meanwhile, the general staff are rewriting the history of their great victory and leaving out the role of the paramilitary. But these people don't work with the military. They are organised criminals who appeared in these unjust times and took justice into their own hands. But the officer who was second in charge of this, the biggest regional army base, during the worst of the fighting, tells a very different story. What were the paramilitaries doing that you objected to? They were killing people. And that was making violence grow and grow and grow. Colonel Alfonso Velasquez was dishonorably discharged when he alleged his commander was working with the paramilitary. Many of them would say, OK, I need this to, what I need is to kill guerrilla. I don't care paramilitary. And if they help me, quotation marks, welcome that help. There are those that continue with the old idea that the uh, param paramilitary groups are their friends and their allies and, in fact, have direct links. As many of these refugees confirmed, the paramilitary have no rules of warfare. Their methods are brutal and have one aim, to terrorise. They have a way of killing. They cut their heads off. Many people were disemboweled and their innards thrown in the river. This is the way they do it. They are laying down the seeds of terror so people will respect them, listen to them and obey them. We 
decided to go in search of the paramilitary warlord Carlos Castaño in his home territory in the neighboring province of Cordoba. As in Yoruba, the real fight here was for control of vast swathes of rich land. By tradition, this farm always belonged to our family. It belonged to my grandfather, then to my father, and now to us, to the sons. The paramilitary here were largely financed by wealthy ranchers like Enrique Vega, who describes Castaño as a hero. He taught us how to fight to protect our lands. With us too was Ramon Fragoso, the man who runs Carlos Castaño's lands in Cordoba, despite the fact the warlord is a wanted man with a price on his head. Before, it was impossible for the ranchers to come here because the guerrilla was in control. The guerrilla could come at any moment shooting, extorting, killing, raiding. Enrique Vega had invited us to his hacienda to see the assets the paramilitary were paid to protect. The Vega family is one of the wealthiest in Cordoba. This is only one of numerous ranches they own. They have the best cattle, the finest animals money can buy, and they intend to keep them. They also have a very close relationship with the military, who now appear to use the ranch as a training base. Enrique Vega said Castaño's men had, as they put it themselves, cleansed the area of subversives. Yes, it was total war. It was a war which they could have won, or we could have won. But we won, and now we are enjoying it. <laughs> For years, Vega and the other ranchers paid protection money to the guerrillas, but Castaño persuaded them to pay him instead to set up and arm a paramilitary force. That decision cost us many lives. Many were killed. There were many kidnappings. But we would not be here today if we had not made that decision. As our time at the ranch wore on, it became increasingly obvious the warlord himself would remain elusive. I think it would be very difficult for anyone to find him. A lot of money has been put on his head, so it's very difficult. The fact is that having cleansed the area, Castaño and his men moved on to greener pastures. But some of those who fought with his paramilitary here stayed behind. Justo Ortega, the manager of the Vega Ranch, had the rank of captain in Castaño's private army. Both Ortega and Castaño were first motivated by revenge. Castaño's rancher father was murdered by guerrillas, and so too was Justo Ortega's brother. <laughs> It was a war of mortal hatred. They would hit us and we would hit them back. We don't have guerrillas now. We don't have thieves. We have no problems now. We're clean. When the paramilitary appeared in the neighboring province of Uruba in the early 1990s, it quickly became the most violent place in Colombia. Typically, the army does not appear in force until an area has already been cleansed. 
but you can track the arrival of the paramilitary in the cemetery of the main town, Apatado. That's when the massacres started. Garcia Lozano, September 2195. Hannibal Julio, September 2195. September 21. Massacres September and counter-massacres by both the paramilitary and the guerrillas. September 21. September 21. In the remote rural areas beyond Apartado, it's still going on. The strategy of using paramilitary forces to fight the guerrillas is spreading now throughout Colombia. Barely a week goes by without reports of a new massacre. We'd heard of a town called San Jose, where the people caught in the middle decided to make a stand. Until recently, there were paramilitary checkpoints on this road. Well, San Jose is effectively outside the army's control. It's about a half an hour down the end of this road in the jungle, in a sort of no man's land surrounded by both paramilitary and guerrillas. And since both sides have been killing civilians, the community declared itself neutral. They want no part of the conflict. They call themselves a peace community. But even since they did that, more than 40 of them have been murdered, the last only a week ago. White flags flutter all through the town, a symbol only of hope over bitter experience. It is one year today since they declared themselves a peace community but this banner shows the names of those who've been murdered since then. San Jose's many martyrs, whose number increases each week. The town is full of refugees from the tiny rural communities deep in the jungle, and among them many widows, like Silvia Martinez and her sister. Our husbands were killed at the same time. They were coming home from work and were kidnapped. They were taken to a house and killed. Their husbands were murdered by the paramilitary, but the guerrillas have shown no mercy either. The violence comes from both sides. If you go towards the mountains, the guerrilla takes you. The other way, the paramilitary gets you. We are always frightened. If you go to one side or the other, you are in danger. We don't know what to do. In spite of the danger, the refugees want to return to their homes. A return is planned for today, two hours walk through the jungle to the hamlet of Union. The people of San Jose say that no one can help them but God. But today, even that faith seems misplaced. This is to tell everyone planning to go home to Union, it is impossible because of the rains. The return is postponed. We will try again tomorrow. The Nobel laureate, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, says that his country is being consumed by a biblical holocaust. More and more innocents are being dragged into the conflict, and for the powerless, there seems little prospect of escape.